little booktube. I have a book haul for you. I know it's the weekend. I know I said I wouldn't, but I went back to the Brattle Bookshop. I had an appointment. First thing in the morning. No leeway whatsoever. And by the time it was done, the shops were opening, and one of those was the Brattle Bookshop in downtown Boston, a great used bookstore that I just love. Uh, it was a beautiful day. It was already being, it was all, the, the chill of the night was already disappearing, even at nine in the morning. Uh, so there was no pain associated with browsing. And the reason why there would be, for those of you who are new and never heard of the Brattle before, is that they have thousands of books outside. So if it's freezing cold, you will. And if you want to go out there and browse, you will be in a great deal of pain. There was none today. And I had a little time. So I went to the Brattle and I got a bunch of books. <laughs> uh, and the first two books that I want to show you, uh, I, I'm not showing you everything because I got some presents as well uh, for you, for, for people, but I didn't want to hold out and spoil the surprise. Uh, but uh, the first two books that I want to show you are, uh, a, a, they're a type of item that has come up before recently in 2021 in these Brattle book hauls. A while ago, I did a Brattle book haul in which I found one volume of a set of the writings of Robert Louis Stevenson. It had uh, familiar studies of books and men. It had a uh, family of engineers. It had, it had, it was a little hardcover. It's right over there. Uh, if I thought I would have had it here to show you, but uh, it, it had a little, uh, it was a little hardcover with a selection of his nonfiction. He wrote a ton of nonfiction in his life. He never stopped writing for money until the day he died. He never stopped writing for money. So uh, there was a ton of it. Uh, and I saw this little hardcover and I thought, well, I don't actually have, it, it, familiar studies is a great book. And it's a great book in my own profession. And I didn't have a copy. And I saw it and thought, well, I don't have a copy and I want one, but this is part of a set. It's part of a uniform set. And each each book has a number on the spine as where they fall in the set. And I don't want a book with a number on the spine. I, I, I'm not gonna have the whole set. So I don't I won't get this one. And I thought better of it. When I was back at the Brattle, I thought, well, you know, you don't have it and you, you want it. And does it really matter that it has a number on the spine? So I got it. It was dirt cheap. Uh, and today I was faced with the same problem, only on a much bigger scale, because today there was a whole set of Robert Louis Stevenson. Not just one volume, one fugitive volume chipped off the whole line, but a whole two shelves worth of his work in another uniform set from 100 years ago. Uh, and I looked at those volumes. They're very pretty. This is what they are. This, this is what they look like. The works of Robert Louis Stevenson. I have volume uh, four and volume 24 here. So it shows you how long the set is. I was looking at them and there was a volume for Kidnapped and uh, Prince Otto and uh, the, 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 the Digger. Just a whole bunch of of some sometimes most of the time two volumes would, would be in one would in one book or maybe three volumes all the south sea writings all of the autobiographical writings all that kind of stuff all the fiction all the poetry uh, I, I i saw at least three volumes of letters and each one of the books was in its own slipcase box and they were all there and i was looking at them and i was thinking okay well <laughs> These are really nice. They're really solid, Re almost linen thick paper. Uh, but I don't want this version of Treasure Island or Kidnap or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I want other versions of those books. I want to have them, but I want other versions of them. I don't want these. Uh, and if that's true, if I'm okay with having Penguin Classics of quite a few of these things, and if I, if I want Scribner's Illustrated for a lot of others or whatever, Travels with a Donkey, there's a wonderful version of that that I don't have at the moment, but that's the one I want. If I already know that, then there's no point in just fetishistically buying the whole set. There's no point in doing that. Uh, so then I started looking through the set for things that I wanted, for, for, for books that I wanted, and I found these two. Uh, volume 24 is Sketches, Criticisms, Lay Morals, and Other Essays. Uh, so let me see if I can... If I can get the uh, the uh, front here, there you go. Uh, and this is these are really solid. They they had their pages were not cut at all, not for any of the ones that I looked at. 
so I had to cut the pages myself. I had to I had to take a really sharp knife and just gently do that throughout the whole book. Uh, and I don't begrudge that because it was a gift set. Obviously, 100 years ago, this was a very expensive gift set, and no one can control what somebody gives them as a gift. So I don't begrudge that the pages weren't cut. Maybe they went to somebody who's not a fan of Robert Louis Stevenson, and they said, okay, well, I'm not going to bother cutting the pages on these things because I'm going to resell the whole thing. I'm going to take them out of town and, and, re and get rid of them right away. I don't want them. Uh, I don't begrudge them that, but it did break my heart because it meant these individual volumes have never been loved. No one's ever read through these things, and Stevenson never wrote a bad word. He's tremendously insightful and eloquent and right there with you, personal, in everything that he wrote. His fiction and his nonfiction, it's all just touched with magic, as one as one critic put it. Uh, and this is a fantastic volume. This this has some great stuff in it. I want to read you just a bit of uh, Lay Morals. Lay Morals is where he lays out his own personal atheism and does it in such a compassionate way uh, that it's just amazing. I'll try not to read too much of it. Uh, there are no guides in life for a thousand reasons, but for the first for this reason first, that we are have all so fallen and so bemired ourselves and grown so bewildered in the paths of this rude labyrinth that not a man among us knows clearly where he is or how he got here. Hence that something of insincerity to which poor clergymen, forced to hold up a cut and dry ideal, is condemned. In this writing, I, having the advantage of the clergy, shall try only to be honest. A hard attempt. We are upon an undertaking very difficult. And not only difficult, but responsible. But the responsibility of the writer discharges not a jot of the responsibility of him who reads. If you go wrong and are guilty of cruel and unmanly acts and come, friendless and hating yourself, to the end of a detestable career, the reading of this book will be no more than a pretext for cowards to allege. There are nearer neighbors within who are incessantly telling you how you should behave, but you waited for the neighbors from without to tell you for some false, easier way. And then he goes on to explain why he's writing a book on atheism and secular morality while using some of the terms that crop up throughout the book. And notice he chastises his fellow atheists, which is terrific. Uh, the name of God and such expressions as sin and the soul have been allowed to find a place in the following pages. This way may be, may be galling to the feelings of the conscientious atheist, that strange and wooden rabbi, and never so strange and so wooden as when very young. But the writer uh, would have him to notice that, as the work goes on, each of these expressions has its sense explained, that the sense at least is eternal, being founded in experience, that to invent new phrases from, from old thoughts, though it may be delicately flattering to a school of philosophy, is not the business of a man who loves and seeks to use the purity of English speech. And lastly, that as the strictest Christians read and find improvement in the books of pagan sages, the most delicate unbeliever may, may come perhaps uninjured from the perusal of the name of God. And it, it's... Uh, I haven't read it in so long. I, I've read some of these critical pieces, but not others. And of course, the other volume is the one I wanted. It has familiar studies. And also uh, uh, literary papers at the end, the, some of which I haven't read in forever. So that is just fantastic. That is just amazing. This this has uh, John Knox and the Company of Women. This has his great essay on Samuel Pepys. This has a great scathing piece on Henry David Thoreau. Just amazingly, amazingly broad thought. Just wonderful. So I got these two volumes, but I don't know that I want any of the other volumes in, in this set. I don't think I do. And I hope that doesn't put me in the bad graces of, of far more formulaic book collectors, because I have ruined that set that's in the Brattle sale lot. I, I have ruined it. The, these volumes aren't in there. So... I don't know, what am I morally compelled to do? Do I do I keep these and say, say la vie, or do I go back and get that whole set? <laughs> I don't know. I imagine next time I'm at the Brattle, I will have a thought or two on the subject. Uh, then this next one is by Lawrence Whistler, and this is a biography of Sir John Vanbrugh. Uh, this is it was somebody's very old copy. It was in a really bad shape. They put a very thick Mylar cover over it. That's fantastic. It has this original design of a cover. And this is a biography of someone we've seen on this channel before. There was a much bigger, more recent biography of Vanbrugh. And this is, I believe, the first systematic biography of him that was ever written. Uh, just drawing on all the primary sources instead of just referring to him in passing. He was uh, a talented playwright. 
He was a talented pamphleteer. He was a talented writer of all sorts, but he was also a talented architect uh, who designed Blenheim Palace, among other things. <laughs> so uh, he's a fascinating figure to study. And I've read that other biography. And when I was reading that, I've read that other biography twice. I have it in the other room. Uh, I've read it twice now. And both times I was thinking, gee, you know, this author refers a lot to, to Whistler's book. I wish I could find a copy and read it. And now I did, so so now I will. Uh, and then this these uh, this next one is a biography of a monster. <laughs> this is by Edward Crankshaw, and this is his famous biography of Bismarck. Uh, and Bismarck too has had a couple of much more recent books, much more recent biographies. And I remember when I was reading them, I reviewed a couple of them, and I was thinking, you know, this is really important. This does lots of new and original thinking. This certainly looks at Bismarck in a much more cosmopolitan way than earlier studies did. Maybe a less heated way than studies that were written by people who had seen Hitler take over Austria, uh, as Crankshaw did. Uh, but there's an eloquence that's missing. And uh, when I read those later biographies, I always missed that eloquence. Now I have this, and I don't think I need more than one Bismarck biography, so this will be it. Uh, and then uh, this next one is by somebody that I'm pretty sure Crankshaw knew. <laughs> and they must have known each other. The author of this book, not the subject. Uh, they must have known each other. Once upon a time, years and years, decades and decades ago, I had this question with a friend of mine. I think we, we were looking at two different books, and it looked like the two authors must have known each other. And I said, boy, I wish... This was before the internet, long before the internet. And uh, I said, I wish there were a way that we could figure that out. I mean, nobody's ever going to write biographies of these two authors, so we're never going to know. And I wish there were a way to find that out. And my friend said, oh, there is a way. I said, really? And he said, yes. Um... Uh, write a letter to the TLS firmly stating that they did not know each other and watch the letters call them. <laughs> you'll, you'll find out if you're right in very little time. I have a feeling these two authors probably knew each other. The author of this book is Brian Crozier. And like Crankshaw, he was a spook. He, was, he worked for British intelligence during the war. And like Crankshaw, he was an expert on all things Russian. And advised leaders of state. I can't believe they wouldn't have elbowed each other in the same waiting rooms at, least, at one time or another. Anyway, this is his. This is also a kind of a first definitive soup to nuts biography, I believe, of its subject, and that subject is De Gaulle, Charles De Gaulle. Uh, huge thing here, and uh, I, I also have a later biography of De Gaulle. Jackson's later biography came out a couple of years ago. Was reviewed everywhere. Was lionized and praised to the skies, and I praised it too. I reviewed it and praised it too. I ranked it very highly on that year's end, end of the year list. But the whole time, again, I was thinking, okay, this is this is definitive. This is incredibly exhaustive. This is indispensable for any future biographer, but it doesn't have the literary panache of the earlier book. And Crozier's book is all through Jackson's bibliography. So I was happy to find this. <laughs> because if it's going to, I mean, Oh, the facts of de Gaulle's life or, or Van Burr's life or Bismarck's life are known. So if you're not tethered anymore to the facts, then what you are looking for is execution. And this will probably be the de Gaulle book that I keep uh, and just not any others. Uh, and then this next one, this next one is certainly a keeper. In fact, it's coming in this room. And I don't know that any of the rest of these are, except maybe the, the Stevenson. Uh, this was a treat. I had this once upon a time. This came out... Uh, when? I want to say 2008. Oh, no, 1998. Good Lord. Uh, this is uh, Ben Faulkner's book, uh, One Man's Chorus. It's a collection of the literary bits and pieces, the reviews and columns and whatnot of the great Anthony Burgess in the last decade of his life. And somebody put it in one of these nice library mylar she things, but I would have taken it in any shape whatsoever. I remember this book, but I hadn't had a copy in forever. And I, as you can tell... You've got Burgess on that back shelf in my rogues gallery here. He's indispensable. I can do without a lot of his fiction, but his nonfiction is indispensable. Just incredible, the things that he could do. And Faulkner's introduction to this volume has the requisite story about how the grand old man of letters, whoever it is, whether it's Kingsley Amos or Christopher Hitchens or Anthony Burgess, the person who's writing about them has to give you an awestruck story about how they composed an entire column on deadline, al fresco, badly hung over and it was wonderful it required no edits whatsoever uh the the introduction here starts off with a story like that there are to be fair more of those stories about burgess than any of the other people who, who garner those stories but uh, so probably some of them are true but this is going to be a delight to reread a delight in fact i will probably indulge myself and read familiar studies by stevenson and this book by burgess 
together immediately in response to this book haul, even though I have work to do, <laughs> even though I have work to do and modern reading to do and writing of my own to do, I will still probably just throw everything aside and deal with those two because it's so enjoyable, just so enjoyable to read one of them uh, on all things literary. Uh, and then the last book that we got for this mail haul wasn't a lot of books. I wasn't feeling very good. I wasn't going to lug a lot of books. The last one we got is one that I've had many times. I'm sure I've hauled it on this channel. Uh, but I I saw it at the battle and realized right away, nope, you're in between copies. I must have sent it away, somebody. Uh, it's World War II history. It's great World War II history. It's uh, Miracle at Midway by Gordon Prang and his co-writers. This, this author is famous for uh, At Dawn We Slept, his, his great book about the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, and this is about uh, the Titanic naval battle that followed shortly after and was a direct sequel to Pearl Harbor, the Battle of Midway, uh, in which a, a large amount of Japanese forces, Japanese aircraft carriers, destroyers, harriers, and whatnot, uh, spread out over a large period of a large space of, of ocean, fought with uh, a, a similar force uh, of American battle carriers, troop carriers, that, that sort of thing. Uh, the Americans were led by Nimitz, and there were, he commanded a galaxy of other great naval officers. And uh, the Japanese plans, such as they were, Japanese were commanded by Yamamoto, and they, they, their plans, such as they were, entirely depended on something that turned out not to be true, secrecy. Because it turned out the Americans had broken their secret codes and knew perfectly well who they were facing that day on the high seas and where they were. And you don't need, I mean, Nimitz didn't need any kind of tactical advantage to, to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Uh, and if you give him that, you better hope for a meteor strike, because if you give him that kind of an advantage, you're going to lose. And the Japanese did, rather decisively. They lost four carriers out of, I think, six. And all four of those carriers had been part of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, and it was, it was a total victory. Uh, for the United States, it turned a massive amount of thinking in the Pacific theater. It was, I mean, the, 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 the Japanese have been sort of set back on their haunches. They, they were, you know, riding high on the elation of the success of the attack on Pearl Harbor and the, the concomitant attacks all across the Pacific. Uh, but they were set back on their hills by uh, the, the Doolittle raid that happened on the Japanese islands. It, it was... The, the raid itself didn't amount to much, but it showed that it could be done. And it showed another thing, too, that the Japanese commanders, especially Yamamoto, should have factored in to a much greater degree than they actually did. It showed that the Americans were angry, not demoralized. <laughs> that the attack on Pearl Harbor had enraged the United States Navy, not disheartened it. <laughs> That's really crucial, and that showed, <laughs> definitely showed, probably most poignantly in the ship. You can't really make it out. It's blurred on the cover here. I don't know why. I don't really understand this cover design, unless it's those dots are meant to be various ships in, in uh, formation, but there weren't that many of them. So, I, But the, the ship that is in, in a blurry black and white photo behind there is the Yorktown, uh, which was the hero of, of Midway. The Yorktown had been badly mauled at Pearl Harbor, and the crews just got on board her and started working around the clock to repair her, to make her seaworthy again. And she was technically seaworthy when she went to, when she joined Nimitz at Midway, but only technically. Uh, it was it was an amazing job. There were repair crews working on her as she left to join to join the fleet. The, there were uh, Japanese memoirs of commanders uh, on the spot said that. For a long time, when the battle was starting, they assumed it was some other carrier. It never crossed their minds that it could be the same one that was bombed at Pearl Harbor. But the Yorktown was destroyed at Midway and and had a, a, a fairly long and slow death. Sometimes you'd be amazed. You you An uh, uh, aircraft carrier takes a torpedo strike in the middle, and you'd be amazed how fast it's gone. One minute, your ears are ringing with the explosion, and it seems like the next minute there's just an oil slick on the ocean and everything's gone, and everyone inside had no time whatsoever to escape. That wasn't true with the Yorktown. It was largely empty when it was torpedoed another two times and, and went down slowly. Slow enough so that all of the, the American ships nearby could lower their, their flags. Slow enough so that uh, 
PBYs flying overhead could dip their wings and salute slow enough so that everyone could watch this ship. The, the, the ship characters at Midway, if you want to call that, one is doomed and that's the Yorktown and the other is the hero and that's the Enterprise. Uh, and Prang makes fantastic reading out of the whole thing. Just It's tough not to, but he does. He makes fantastic reading out of it. So whenever I get this book, I give it away. I'm going to hope that I don't do that this time because it belongs in a World War II library. It, if you have a World War II library of books, even if it's only 10 books wide, it belongs there. So so that was our, our Brattle mail, our Brattle book haul for today. We had Miracle at Midway. Uh, we had uh, One Man's Chorus, uh, Collected Last Writings of Anthony Burgess. We have uh, Brian Crozier, his big biography of Charles de Gaulle. We have Edward Crankshaw's big biography of Otto von, von Bismarck. We have Lawrence Whistler's biography of Sir John Vanbrugh. Uh, and we have two volumes of the collected works of Robert Louis Stevenson. The two volumes that really deal with his, um, what we would now call literary journalism, with his book reviews, book prefaces, book thoughts, and that. Although there, there is one little book in one of these, one little collection of nonfiction pieces that is travel writing, which he was also perfect at. And uh, some of the pieces in there are, I haven't read in forever. Some of the pieces where he talks about Ireland, for instance, or, 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 or England, they're just walking around is just amazing. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, it's not a big book haul, but I'm very happy with it. <laughs> very, very happy with it. I'm going to clean these things up and go over them all and then do a little bit of indulgent reading. And then I have to get to writing. <laughs> I have to get to work. I have to spend the rest of the night working and maybe... All of tomorrow, I don't know what tomorrow will be like. I, th I, One of you pointed out, no, in fact, four or five of you by now have pointed out that when I said no videos for this weekend, a lot of you wanted to know, well, what about the mystery we would be doing with, with David Murphy? You can't leave that up. That's entirely true. I can't leave that out. So I will make at least that video tomorrow, but there might not be anything else. Um, and aside from that, there's only a milestone to think about. I am pretty sure that today's videos on this channel We'll put this this channel over 4,000 videos. And I haven't done the stats. I haven't broken this down or checked anywhere. But I'm fairly certain no booktuber has ever done anything close to that. And I'm not 100% sure that any YouTuber has. A team, maybe, where you've got eight different channels. But has, has any one person on YouTube ever made 4,000 videos? I don't know. Maybe it's a small number and I just don't know about it. But one way or another feels pretty significant <laughs> to have dragged you all through 4,000 videos. I think that happens today. Uh, but I don't know how. Maybe a Q&A to celebrate that. <laughs> One way or another. One way or another, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to I'm gonna spend a little too much time with these books and then get to work. Uh, but I will see you tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, book two.